The ant is one of the smallest creatures on this, our Earth, yet it remains one of the most mysterious creatures ever devised by God, our Holy Father. I'm David McGann, and tonight on David McGann's World, we take a very probing look at a very probing documentary on this most unique, yet individual <laughs> thing. Though we knew, the ant can carry up to 10,000 times its own weight. More if it were larger. If an ant, for example, were this elephant, or this one, it could carry the Eiffel Tower on its back. Or two Eiffel Towers if they teamed up. Which would not be all that unusual, given that elephants are very social insects. Alternatively, the elephants could carry one Eiffel Tower the size of the Empire State Building. It's largely a question of what's practical in terms of harness design. Another option would be to have the Eiffel Towers retain the weight of the Empire State Building, but adopt the shape of something easier to carry, like a briefcase. Or perhaps it could mutate into a third elephant, which could simply walk by itself. By definition, carrying 10,000 times less than its potential, and leaving the other two elephants free to carry other buildings. And so we bid farewell to these plucky little fellows, who have truly earned the name Ant. As opposed to these creatures here, which I think are some sort of goat. <laughs> yes, the ant. Certainly not an elephant. <laughs> I've been David McGann. Good night. <laughs> Natural disasters, just who was responsible? Volcanoes, tidal waves, cyclones, earthquakes and avalanches. Like the four horsemen of the apocalypse, except with an extra one, they cause havoc and destruction of property wherever they canter. Tonight we look at the very upsetting world of footage which can occur when natural disasters are happening and there's a camera about and it's pointed at them and it's turned on. So join with me, won't you now? for the upsetting world of disaster footage. <laughs> these pools of smoke are big, as are these, 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 and these. Look how small that boat is by comparison. Unlike smoke, flood damage is caused by water. Water like this. Millions of dollars of property, and this dog, lost in the veritable whirlpool of water which spreads like wildfire, causing heartbreaking muddiness to these negroid gentlemen and these dead birds here. Yes, sir, in the magical world of natural disaster, no one is to blame and nothing is certain, except for these sort of goaty creatures. Mm, mm. Makes you hum, doesn't it? Until next week then, and then again too, I imagine, this is David McGann saying goodbye and then hello again too. Good night. Hello, and welcome to David McGann's World. Thank you very much indeed for joining me, David McGann. Zebras are curious creatures, aren't they? <laughs> that rhetorical question has been asked of nobody in particular since the very dawn of time, and the answer has always been the same, unnecessary. Today on David McGann's World, we look at nature's own stripy horse in zebra fun. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. <laughs> Stands up when he goes to bed, world's most stripy quadruped, zebra, oh zebra, zebra, zebra. Nature's zebra seems to be forever wearing pyjamas, but his dual colour is there for a purpose, camouflage. Zebra, oh zebra, zebra, zebra. If you look very carefully, you can just make out the outline of some zebras feeding off this dead tree. They're cunning, making them virtually invisible from traditional predators like the hippo and the always lanky giraffe. Zebra, 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 zebra. Yes, camouflage is the zebra's best friend, as it is for this bus who uses the zebra's markings to pass unnoticed through the herd, as opposed to these goats whose horns give them away. Zebra, 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 zebra. Zebra. 
the zebra, as mysterious and beautiful as it is black and white. I'm David McGann. Until next week, then, good night. <laughs>
or in this little fellow's case, nuts. Specifically, the head area of it. They're cute and they're cuddly on their own, but get them in plague proportions numbering in their tens of millions, and they're less so. You have to cram them into their little wheel for a start, and also one million mice in your pocket can be pretty heavy. And to prove my point, let's do some sums. One million mice at one ounce is... It's a lot. I'm talking about thousands. But the mouse is a rodent of contrasts. Hello, I'm David McGann. Let us look now at cinemagratic images of the mysterious mouse. Mice are small. <laughs> Mice. They're considered a delicacy in some of the less scrupulous restaurants around Melbourne. In India, they're worshipped as gods. Somewhere in between, I believe, lies the truth. And it's ironic, I think, that the truth should one day be found lying somewhere. <laughs> and find it we will one day. And when we do, you can be sure that David McGann's world will be there to bring these murdering bastards to justice. Ta-ta for now. <laughs>1940s. There was never a decade quite like it, except obviously in previous centuries. But the music was different then. Oh yeah, mm. the music made famous in the 1940s by Duke Basie and Count Ellington was literally unheard of in the 18 and 1740s. It was a time of great change. The war was on, Nelson would defeat Napoleon at Waterloo, and in France they were wearing their heads a lot shorter. <laughs> Join with me now, won't you, as we look at the wonderful world of cosmetic surgery. <laughs> cosmetic surgery is performed by special doctors who wear blue hats and green clothes. 
Though they look funny, they aren't. Their job is serious. Doctors study for years to wear these coveted hats and clothings. Only then can they look at x-rays like these and down microscopes like these so that they may cure people who look like this. Yes, indeed. Cosmetic surgery. It certainly gets your feet a tapping and your fingers a clicking. And I hope you've enjoyed this walk down surgery lane. And join me next week, won't you, for another David McGann's World. I'd certainly appreciate that a lot. <laughs> Good night. Lizards. There are almost five million different species throughout the known world. Perhaps more in the unknown world. Although the very unknowability of that world makes it very difficult <laughs> to be safe. Hello, I'm David McGann. Join me now on David McGann's World as I, David McGann, watch and narrate this documentary on lizards. I'm told it's quite good. Lizards are as many in number as they are in quantity. Large, but for their size, they have all the creature comforts of a creature. Tongue, head, body and legs. Not to mention arms. And with good reason. They don't have any. As not seen here. Reptilian in nature and in captivity, lizards come in many shapes and forms. There's the blue tongue, so called because of its frill neck. And the frill neck, which is often mistaken for the blue tongue because of its legs. There is also the monitor, so named because it's possible to look at it. The drop tail because it's green. Then of course there's the old goanna. But most striking of all is the unusual and talented chameleon, seen here standing in front of a couple of goats. Hmm, fascinating, truly fascinating. The incredible, scarcely human world of the lizard. Until then, good night. Whale song. Pretty difficult to dance to, but essential for the mating of these amazingly big creatures that scientists call whales. Hello, I'm David McGann. No. But the world's whale population is steadily declining. Efforts are being made to preserve them, but museums can only do so much. Join with me now, my friends, as we look at the tragic story of the humpback whale. The whale is a very fat fish indeed, yet it has the grace of a bird when it comes to swimming underwater. A massively large bird with no feathers or beak who can breathe through a hole in its head. Yet the whale is a bird in crisis. Though it has survived for millions of years, few of these majestic beasts manage to survive being harpooned and eaten. It would require enormous skill to adapt to being digested, pass from the body and return to the sea as untreated sewage. It is indeed a rare and very special piece of human excrement that can be heard singing the haunting song of the humpback whale. Whales, they're proud... No, no, it's all right, I'll do this bit. Fine. Whales, they're proud and magnificent and delicious. And I wonder, do Eskimos really need to make lipsticks out of them? Surely they should start off with something a little smaller. Good night. Space. Of all the frontiers, it is the last and perhaps the most final to be explored by man. The space race of the 1960s was a fast one. Who would get there first was the question. The cosmonauts or the astronauts? Well, it was actually a dog. But the moon was a different matter. It was much bigger. And when Buzz Aldrin uttered those most immortal words, No, Neil, after you, America became the kings and queens of outer space. And they would be certainly no stranger to seeing this from their rocket ship windows. Well, obviously not this globe. Um, this isn't a scale, it's a much larger arrangement, of course. <laughs> Join with me now, then, as we examine this fascinating documentary. <laughs> about a fascinating subject, out of space, entitled Beyond the Moon. Enjoy.
Well, obviously it's not called Beyond the Moon in Joy. There's a space in between those words. <laughs> When Orville and Wilbur Wright first invented the aeroplane in 1898, I wonder if they realised that exactly 104 years later, the Apollo 11 would land on the moon and Neil Armstrong would plant the American flag on its soil. Highly unlikely. That sort of detail, particularly knowing Neil Armstrong's name, would have required enormous precognitive ability. But despite the Wright brothers' ignorance of things to come, they happened anyway. $300 billion poured into the space program over the last 25 years. Money which could have been used to purchase loaves of bread for the starving. In fact, $300 billion would have purchased enough bread to stretch, ironically, from here to the moon. Even more ironically, rockets would have had to have been used to take the bread out that far into space. Rockets which would not have been available due to the money for their manufacture being spent on the original purchase of the bread. Not only that, but the starving would not have benefited from the purchase of the bread owing to the wasteful use of that bread in the construction of the Earth-Moon Bridge. In any event, most of the loaves would have been stale by the time the unavailable rockets had brought them back to earth or burned up on re-entry. And you can't feed the starving stale toast. Not without a condiment anyway. But unfortunately, the space program has only so much money. Jam alone cost almost $2.30 a jar. It would take the defence budgets of several United States of Americas to spread that much preserve on a dismantled and stale Earth-Moon toast bridge, even half that size. An inedible testament to man's thoughtlessness. As are these. Until next week then. Until next week then, this is Dave McGann saying goodnight. <laughs>and welcome to a very, very special David McGann's world for this week. I am David McGann. Genetic engineering. It's a word that conjures up fear and terror into the hearts and ears of the common man. Or to be precise, two words that do those things that I just told you then. In his lifetime, man has dared to tamper with nature, to create several things, using his unnatural sciences to domesticate the chicken, and create the Z-Donk. But these atrocities pale into insignificance when compared with the abomination against God that is the nectron. Half apricot, half plum, this Frankenstein of fruit is an unholy union which will one day metaphorically turn on its creator, pull the arm off a policeman and die in a burning windmill which has been torched by angry villagers, angry over the death of a blind hermit who taught it to speak smoke cigars, and learn to appreciate violin music. <laughs> let us then sit back and let this very somber... <laughs>
Both couldn't fly, but for different reasons. Unlikely allies in a strange land. He wears a bell just like a cow. He don't go moo, he goes meow. Cat, 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 cat. My Sphinx hasn't got a nose. How does he smell? <laughs> he doesn't. He's not alive and is made entirely from stone, even if he was. There's much from them that we could learn. They bring us laughter and ringworm. Cat, 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 cat. Cats are brown, as this exception to the rule proves. Getting into all manner of strife, a Humphrey bear that kills Lady Bird life. Cat, 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 cat. Cat, 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 cat. <laughs> Ironic, isn't it, that the very strings I played then are made from the very gut of the animal the song's about. Just another example of nature's delicate balance. As am I, David McGann. Until then, good night. John F. Kennedy. <laughs> Perhaps the finest assassinated American president ever to have lived. At least up until the point he died. Hello, I'm David McGann. The mystery of who shot JFK remains shrouded in mystery. A cloak of silence hangs over it. Hanging, some say, from the closed hook of conspiracy. Also there beside it, on the hat rack of betrayal, is a hat. And whose head does it fit? Lee Harvey Oswald's? Or was the hat worn by the KGB? Presumably on some sort of roster basis. Only when the owner of both the Shroud of Mystery and the Cloak of Silence retrieves these garments with the dry cleaning ticket of confession will we know for certain. That is, until now. Sit back, relax and enjoy the assassination of John F. Kennedy. <laughs> John Frederico Kennedy was born here in this photograph in 1911. Though only a baby at the time, he possessed the ability to adapt that would make him famous. His body cells multiplied and he grew in size so that within a mere four decades, he was much larger and 40. It was in this form that he would become the president he would eventually cease to be that fateful day in Memphis in 1963 when Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly stabbed him. But consider this, Lee Harvey Oswald has three names. So does the man who killed Abraham Lincoln, John Wilkes Booth. Sihan Sihan, who assassinated Robert Kennedy, only had two names, but they were both the same. And the coincidence doesn't end there. The letters in Oswald's name add up to 15, as do the letters in Booth's name. Sihan Sihan's first name adds up to six, as does his second, and that's a total of 12. 12 plus 15 plus 15 is 42. The same age Kennedy was when elected to office and exactly the number of feet between the motorcade and the grassy knoll when the first shot was heard, give or take a few feet. After the shooting, Oswald ran to a theatre. After his shooting, Booth ran to a bookshop. Though he did so over a hundred years earlier, it doesn't alter the fact that the word shooting has eight letters in it. Exactly the same number of letters in the name of Jack Ruby, who shot Oswald some three days later. Add that three to the twelve letters in Sihan Sihan's name and you get that number again, 15. Half the number of letters in both Booth's and Oswald's names combined, eight less than the total number of shots fired in the Kennedy assassination, and two more than John Wilkes Booth's middle name if you misspelled it. And what of the grassy knoll? The logic is inescapable, yet there are those who say that these figures prove nothing. Perhaps. But whether it be nothing, or whether it be something, one thing is for certain. These creatures here. Hmm. Well, I for one am not totally unconvinced that those goats were not involved. This is Dave McGain, closing the book on yet another knee, and saying until next week then, good night, as indeed I just did. <laughs> my dear and very good friends. <laughs> Ever wondered where law and order comes from? Well, no wonder no longer, for here is a documentary. Oh, here in my hands, of course, this is in fact a Chinese wooden man, but up there in the control room, ready to be edited in shortly after my introduction. And what an introduction it will be. An introduction, an introduction would have ended by now, had it not been for the fact that I, in fact, referred to the fact that I was including it. <laughs> Sit back. Relax and enjoy.
the ironic denial of the very promise I was in the process of making. Not to mention further adding to the delay by acknowledging it, as I have now. Hello, I'm David McGann. <laughs> Sit back. Oh, we've already started. <laughs> Though these men may resemble Father Christmas, they aren't him at all. Father Christmas has a long white beard, is fictitious, and doesn't have a law degree. Judges, on the other hand, don't, aren't, and do, respectively. The difference is even more obvious when one visits them in a courtroom. Very few of the judges enter the building via the chimney. Purists maintain that this would tend to detract from the dignity of the court, as would these. <laughs> judges do, however, live in the North Pole, a place which lives up to its name in two important respects. It's Northern and it's Polish, or Polar, as some scientists would have it. One of these scientists is Professor Norris Austin, research chemist at Yale University and Nobel Prize winner who unfortunately you won't be hearing from tonight owing to time restrictions and the fact that we haven't interviewed him. <laughs> well, there you have it, an exhaustive look at the Australian legal system. Until next week then, when we present... It's not as funny as you'd think. <laughs> Though science has come a long way since primitive man first thought of splitting the atom, the scourge of all diseases, nature's... <laughs> which is cholera, still continues to affect up to 100% of those suffering from it. Why? Well, the easy answer would be, I don't know. I'm not a doctor specialising in that area. But it's an answer that the makers of this documentary you're about to see avoid like the very plague it's about. <laughs> Never in my entire life reiterated such a fascinating thing as what you'll be seeing. And a warning to young viewers at home, don't you go handling electrical plugs without adult supervision. <laughs> these people look happy enough, they're not. They're content enough to smile for our cameras, but deep down, cholera has made them sad. Cholera, cholera, cholera infested villages like these in South America have little to recommend them and do an appalling tourist trail. No, no, sorry, I was just finding my place. Las Vegas, on the other hand, does extremely well with its enormous gambling industry and casino staff unaffected by pestilence. <laughs> It's all right, no one will notice. Over one million people come to Las Vegas every year to play the tables and sit on the chairs. No one has ever contracted anything more serious than typhoid. No, don't. So too in Star, winter revelers may die of ruptured internal organs or spinal injuries, but never anything more serious. Hey! That went rather well. <laughs> so I think the message there is pretty clear. If you're thinking of going on a holiday this year, avoid going with a diseased chicken. <laughs> and so from Dave McGann's world, this is me, Dave McGann, bidding you, as they do in gay Paris, adios, muchachos. <laughs> Good evening. Yes, the history of dentistry is as long as the very teeth it's about. Good evening, I'm David McGann. <laughs> you know something? In 19... In... Oh, that's better. In 1933, an enterprising young dentist by the name of Carl Weintraub invented what could only be described as the dental training book, a marvellous mechanism by which sputum was removed from the mouth during the examination. <laughs> Join with me now as we sit back, relax and enjoy a riveting documentary <laughs> on the history of the thing that I just said. <laughs> Teeth. It's what sets us apart from animals that don't have them. Animals like worms and the humble budgie. Not to mention also the shark. 
so not mentioned here today for the reason that it doesn't fit into the category of animals that don't have teeth. <laughs> here in Austria in 1957, when Linnaeus had not only died 200 years earlier, but in a completely different country, the very rules of animal classification were being redefined by this man. A man whose name will live forever across the vast eons of time, but which does escape me for the moment. Cat, 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 cat. cat. <laughs> Our teeth. Like cutlery, you eat with them, but unlike cutlery, you don't clean them with turn off. <laughs> this is David McGann. Did he? Bidding you until next week, good tortoises, turtles. Call them what you will, they're all different animals. But none is more different than nature's very own wily fox. A cunning member of the dog family who lives in the verdant or sometimes green forests they inhabit. This plucky little vermin is sometimes replaced with peppermint in Australian fox hunts. And peppermint is very difficult to mount. <laughs> Hello, I'm David McGann. Join with me now as we learn more about the fascinating world of trees. I'd be delighted. An old Buddhist once asked if a tree fell in the forest, would anyone hear it? The answer depends on two things. Whether anyone was in the forest to hear the noise of the tree, and whether anyone was near the Buddhist to hear him ask the question in the first place. <laughs> Buddhism was invented by this ceramic figure many years before the birth of Christ. Christ, seen here before his coronary bypass operation, was a very religious man who wore criticism and a beard. He had a church named after him for chronological reasons. It was St. Peter's in Rome. Rome is in Italy, and is a land, or city, depending on what I'm talking about, of contrasts. At night, it's a buzzing metropolis full of tourists. And by day, it's the same, only with more light. Light travels at the speed of itself. This means that a single beam of light traveling a distance would arrive in the same time it took to complete the journey and be there to greet itself. Light is nothing if not polite. As are these goaty creatures here. If I were me, I'd get out of there, right? Well, that makes one of us. Yes, well, there you have it, the mysteries of the tortoise revealed. Whether it will bring down this government remains to be seen. I, for two, don't think it won't. Good night. How long we had that? <laughs> Good evening. Marco Polo, perhaps the greatest explorer the world has ever seen. Ironically, the world that saw him was the very same world that he himself saw while in the process of exploring it. Mm. It certainly makes you consider that fact that I just mentioned. Yes. Hello, I'm David McGann. Join me. Excuse me, just one moment. Yes. This documentary you're about to see chronicles the adventures of Marco Polo, Italian of no fixed address, as he ventures to the new lands to look at um, and discover spaghetti explosions and uh, syphilis. Enjoy. <laughs>
Marco Polo was born here in Palermo quite some time ago. The son of two parents, he was educated here at the University of Capistrano, where he read law and a copy of Knocked Up Mummers, before setting out across the ocean in search of the riches of the new world. Riches which some commentators describe as one of the most beautiful things ever seen in the history of mankind, as are these goatee creatures here. Yes, astonishing stuff there, I think you'll concur. Well, you've been joining me, David McGann, so until next week, good evening from me, David McGann, as I just said. Today, I trust I find you well. The United States of America, or at least a map of it. Home to mum's apple pie, patriotism, and at least 30 million American citizens. But why is the population so huge? Some say it's because of the number of people that live there, and they might be right. I'd like, if I may, to quote from Charles Erasmus Keynes, who once said, Join with me now as for the first time in my history I look at a documentary for which I recorded the voiceover for only last week. My producers assure me that it's very good. Up to a point. Look up the word archipelago in any dictionary and you usually find it two entries before the word architecture. Architecture in America is represented in many of the buildings there. The style can be summed up in one word, Neo-Georgian or New Georgian. So I guess that's actually two words. The columns used to support many of the roofs which sit atop these architectural structures vary in colour depending on what type of film was used to photograph them. This building here is over 100 feet tall, only 10 feet wide and completely solid, thus making it very difficult to rent out even as student accommodation. But these goats here do not. Yes, indeed. Ah, America. <laughs> It certainly is that place. This is David McGann saying good evening. Yeah.